I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome again to The Empowered Neurologist. You know, one of the exciting things I get to do in this job hosting this program is I get to interact with people I've never met who've written good books or done great research or are doing great things in the clinic. Well, today's a little bit different. I'm going to be interviewing a good friend of mine for the past 20 years, Dr. Mark Hyman. Dr. Mark uh, Hyman has a new book out called Food Fix and uh, how to save our health, our economy, our communities, and our planet one bite at a time. And I will admit that this recording is taking place uh, in late March 2020. You know, normally we like to do these things evergreen, but I think that you're going to see in our interview that uh, there are some powerful implications of what we eat in terms of what we see going on around the world, uh, for example, in terms of immune function. Uh, in terms of uh, susceptibility, perhaps, to uh, having a worse outcome by virtue of the fact that people have underlying medical conditions that may, in fact, be brought on by the foods that people are eating. And that's what Dr. Hyman is talking about. I think this may be his best book. As you know, he's written multiple New York Times bestsellers. We've talked to him many times in the past about his books. Uh, but, you know, this one really takes the notion of the foods we eat well beyond our waistlines and looks at the implications for us uh, from a planetary perspective in terms of economy, in terms of jobs, and certainly in terms of health. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Mark Hyman. He is a practicing family physician and he's an internationally recognized leader, speaker, educator, and certainly an advocate of what is called functional medicine. Maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that today. He's the founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center. He is the head of the strategy and innovation uh, part of the Cleveland uh, Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. And he is a, as mentioned, multiple, in this case, 13 time uh, New York Times bestselling author and board president for clinical affairs uh, for the Institute of Functional Medicine. He is the host of one of the leading health podcasts called The Doctor's Pharmacy. That's pharmacy with an F. Uh, I've been on that a couple of times, uh, and he's a regular medical contributor to several television shows and networks, including the CBS, uh, CBS This Morning, Today, Good Morning America, The View, and CNN. He's also an advisor and guest co-host on the Dr. Oz Show. So we're going to jump right in and uh, talk to Dr. Hyman uh, about his new book, the food, uh, which is Food Fix, but also... Uh, about some other ideas uh, in terms of what we're seeing going on around us. So let's jump into our interview. Well, hello, Mark. How are you doing? Hi, David. Well, you know, I'm doing like everybody's doing. I'm uh, making the most of this really tough time and trying to figure out how to keep my cat from going crazy inside, although he's not completely quarantined. <laughs> he goes outside. And I, I think, uh, you know, we're trying to find the best way through this for ourselves, for our families, for our businesses, and uh, everybody's coming together. And I, I think it's a unique moment where the entire human race is united in this common experience, which uh, is has been a really uh, uh, compelling thing. I think over the last uh, decades, we've seen more division and more opposition and more divisiveness in our society. You write it about in your book, Brainwash. And I think this is a, sort of a unique, unifying experience that who knows what will happen afterwards, but uh, it may be some good. Yeah, I have to tell you that uh, I had this just wave yesterday of, of all things, gratitude. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think that I walked down my street like I did yesterday and, and felt such gratitude just for the moment, you know? We're always thinking about where we're going to go and this and that, and just it really is um, forcing us to be in the moment. And, uh, you know, we're not running around. We're not on planes and doing all the stuff, oh. right? We're home and doing the doing what we need to do. I took um, a long hour and a half walk this morning on this trail. It was not a single person um, and just enjoyed the quiet. And the yeah, wood and the it's river. really amazing. And all of a sudden, we're, it's forcing us to uh, into a place of, of reconnecting. Um, here's your book. And I, I have to tell you that, uh, you know, I, I got all my questions here uh, that were prepared for uh, me ahead of time, you know, for, uh, weeks ago for this interview. Uh, but I think it's going to be a different interview. It has to be. And no, normally we do these, they're evergreen. We can show them at any point. But what is the day today? It's March 26, 2020. And uh, we've got to look at food kind of differently. And, I, and where I wanted to take our conversation is what we're seeing uh, in response to coronavirus is that people who have underlying medical conditions 
yes. seem to be doing worse. Yes. Terms, and what is by and large the cause of these underlying medical condi conditions that are leading to a poor outcome? Well, you're so right, David. I think this is this coronavirus uh, pandemic is highlighting the underlying weaknesses in our global health and our healthcare system. And in fact, the data from China is pretty stark. If you have heart disease, you're 10 times more likely to die. If you have diabetes, you're over 7%, no, seven times more likely to die. So these are, these are staggering numbers that are, are, for me, highlighting the fact that chronic disease um, is a pandemic. It's been not well recognized as a threat. And yet it is the biggest threat right now globally to hum humanity because um, we're seeing probably three quarters of the deaths on the planet caused by lifestyle and food preventable disease. Um, 11 million people die every year. I think this is a conservative estimate just from eating bad food, not eating enough good food. This is a global burden of disease study, 195 countries. Uh, and 60% and of our calories in America is ultra processed food. And in terms of coronavirus, the reason we're seeing these, these increased susceptibilities is because people are not well nourished. Mm. And in order to be uh, resistant to the um, virus and to be able to recover from the virus, you need adequate nutrition. Uh, and the diet we have is mostly uh, corn, wheat, and soy, turned in all kinds of size, shapes, colors, uh, tastes and smells of uh, extruded food-like substances that shouldn't even be called food that are incredibly nutrient poor and uh, are leaving people overweight. If you're obese, you're almost three times as likely to die from coronavirus as you would be if you didn't have obesity. And yet we see that now in 42% of our population, 75% are overweight. I mean, it changes every year. I keep having to update my slides because the <laughs> obesity rate keeps going like this. And if if you look at the, the growth in coronavirus, it's like a hockey stick like this. Over, over weeks, right? If you right. look at the growth of obesity and chronic disease, it's also a hockey stick, except it's been over 40 years. So really, it's almost like this frog in boiling water problem, where if you put a frog in boiling water, it jumps out. If you slowly heat it up, it just stays there. And that's the difference between coronavirus. It's the frog jumping in boiling water, and we're all on fire about it. But we need to be equally as on fire about the, the chronic disease epidemic. And we know that, for example, sugar suppresses immunity. You know, that sugar feeds viruses, and that means starch as well. And you read a lot about this, David. And I just read an article this morning that salt, excess salt, which is found in processed food, it's not the salt you put on your food. It's the salt that's added to your food by corporations also suppresses your immunity. So we, we really have to face this, this fact that uh, if we want to survive and thrive in this era of this pandemic, we need to focus on our health and our nutrition as a way of fortifying our own health and also reducing our risk of infection and reducing the risk of spreading it uh, to our, our loved ones and our fr friends and family. You know, one of the interesting findings that, uh, during this uh, pandemic has been, at least once it got to America, it, I think a lot of people were surprised saying that, you know, uh, at least 20, but perhaps more percent of people who are being hospitalized are relatively younger. In other words, between the ages of 20 and, and 54. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as I presented that, uh, in one of my podcasts, people were saying, how can that be? I mean, young people are healthy in America. Well, the reality is, as you well pointed out, that that's just not true, no. that America's young people are not healthy, that we have soaring rates of obesity and overweight and even diabetes. So these underlying medical conditions yes. uh, that are so prevalent in our so-called younger people uh, are now manifesting in terms of poorer outcome as it relates to having this infection. Well, think about it. If, if you know, if you if you look at the data, one in two Americans has prediabetes or type two diabetes. Ninety percent of them don't know it. So even if you're thirty or forty, you if you have belly fat, you likely could be in that range of prediabetes, which is dramatically increasing your risk of of having more severe complications from coronavirus. <clears throat> You, um, in your book, you didn't pull any punches and you mentioned how uh, the food industry is actually preying upon young people. Really, they're just, you know, they're, they've got them in their gun sights. And tell us a about that. Well, you know, I, I just want to back up a little bit. You know, the food, the, the whole premise of Food Fix is, the, is that 
you know, our, all of our problems are connected to the food system in some way or another, right? Our children's health and their obesity rates, the ADD, their challenges in academic performance, obviously, as you mentioned, but also, you know, the chronic disease epidemic, uh, our economic burden, we, we, are, we are in serious doo-doo. Right now, we just passed a $2 trillion stimulus package. That money is money we don't have. It's debt, right? It's debt. And the debt we now have is 22, maybe it's now $24 trillion. A lot of that has to do with chronic disease. So our economic system is, is weakened by chronic disease. Climate, uh, the number one cause of climate change is our food system. The number one you know, source of environmental degradation, you know, is the, is the is the food system and all the downstream consequences. Even national security, our kids are not able to, to to be recruited for the military because they're unfit to fight. So you've got all these issues. And the way that it, it, it's heard to me is that as a, as a physician sitting in my office for 30 years seeing patients, I realize that, you know, most of my patients' diseases are caused by food in some way or another. And they can be cured by food. And I'm like, well, what's the cause of the food? It's the food system. Well, what's the cause of the food system? It's our food policies. What's the cause of the food policies? It's the influence of the largest industry on the planet, which is the food industry. It's $15 trillion or 17% of the world economy. So then I'm like, okay, well, what are they doing? Well, they have a very coherent strategy that's multifaceted that is driving so much of these problems and not solving them. First, they fund, quote, nutrition research. They spend 12 times as much as the government, about $12 billion a year on, quote, nutrition research, studies like candy consumption increases weight loss in children. No joke. <laughs> the reference is in my book. Um, they fund uh, professional societies like the American Heart Association, the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, which receives 40% of its funding from the food industry, and co-ops their messaging such that craft singles, which aren't even allowed to be called cheese because they're not 51% cheese, were named as a healthy food by the uh, <laughs> Academy of Nutrition Dietetics. How does that right. make sense? Uh, and, then, and then we see the American Heart Association saying tricks are a healthy breakfast cereal. Right, Cheerios are heart smart. That. Well, Cheerios, you know, you could argue maybe, but, uh, but, the, but the Cocoa Puffs and tricks and Fruit Loops, I mean, What's gone on there? So they're, I, they're, I am truly now cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Just. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then uh, so you've got them infiltrating professional societies, which co-ops their recommendations that, uh, for example, the American Heart Association is funded heavily by the vegetable oil lobby, right? By the canola oil uh, association, for example. Uh, so you've got that. And then you've got them influencing front groups that put out misinformation. So there are massive misinformation campaigns, like, for example, uh, American Council on Science and Health, which sounds like a great, respectable organization, but they are the ones who say that pesticides, smoking, trans fats, and high fructose corn syrup are all fine for you, and they are the ones who spent $30 million to fight GMO labeling in California. Of course, they got their money from Monsanto and Big Ag and Big Food. No surprise. Uh, so you've got these front groups acting. And then, you, you know, groups like the uh, Climate Smart Agriculture. Now, who's not for Climate Smart Agriculture, right? It's funded by the fertilizer companies, <laughs> which are one of the biggest contributors to climate change. Um, and, then, and then you've got, uh, so you've got, you've got funding of science. You've got co-opting professional scientists. You've got front groups. Then, then, they, then they actually focus on minorities and advocacy groups, like Feeding America, right? because these are the groups that are focused on hunger. So for example, they prevent them from supporting making nutrition a value in the SNAP program. Right now, SNAP or food stamps, you can buy soda, junk food, and they oppose any guidelines to improve the quality of the food through food stamps because they don't want to stigmatize the poor. Well, on the board of these social advocacy groups are big foods, CEOs and, and uh, executives. Uh, and then you've got you know, for example, these, these groups also funding the NAACP and the Hispanic Federation, uh, which is why African-Americans and Hispanics who are most targeted and most susceptible to these diseases are often opposed to what seems to be policies that would be in their benefit. Mm. So and that, where, whereby people like yourself are, are then looked upon as being opposed to supporting these groups. 
like yeah, NAACP. Well, you know, I, maybe I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't. I, I, I do actually. I actually gave a talk. People can Google it and go food oppression hymen, and it's a ten minute talk I gave at the Harlem Riverside Church about uh, our food as a, as a system of oppression for the poor and the minorities. Yes. And you uh, talked about that in your book as well. Yeah, for sure. And then, and then, and then, you know, so you've got all these different things, and then, and then they they focus on marketing. So, uh, and, and this is more in, in answer to your question about children. You know, not only do they prey on minorities and the poor, and they do this through very specific targeted marketing. For example, the Yale Rudd Center for um, Food Policy uh, was really clear in its research that the amount of ads that African-American and Hispanic kids see for soda and junk food far exceeds that of whites because they target them. Mm -hmm. um, but, but this food industry does really, they spend literally billions of dollars on marketing junk food to kids, kids who can't tell the difference until they're nine years old between the show and uh, a, a commercial. Right. Uh, and, and, they, and, they, and they know this. They even look at imaging of brain imaging of functional MRIs on little two-year-olds to see what visual images of food will stimulate them the most. And this is why you get a two-year-old who can barely talk or walk is actually able to name brand name foods and ask their parents to buy them in the grocery store. Uh, the amount of advertising in schools, the, the, you've got Coca-Cola, you know, banners in bathroom stalls, you've got it in gymnasiums, you've got them funding, quote, funding schools for their programs, but it allows them to infiltrate the schools with all these, these um, products that are harming these kids. And well, then let, there's me go, let me go back to uh, the, the targeting of children with advertising. Uh, Chile yeah. has been, I mean, for those of, you, uh, of our viewers who are thinking, well, that's just the way it is, can't do anything about it. Let's walk through what, what happened in Chile and how yeah, effective yeah. that was. Sure. Just one more point about this, because uh, before I go on, you know, there, there, there are five point, so, so advertising on television is one thing, and that's terrible. You know, kids see probably four to 10,000 ads on TV a year. But there were 5.4 billion ads on Facebook, billion with a B, ads directed at kids for junk food last year. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just staggering. And in Chile, they were like, enough, right? But it was really a unique situation. There was a moment in time when the president of Chile was a pediatrician, a doctor, and the vice president of the Senate was a doctor. Michelle Bachelet and um, and uh, and and the Senate head of the, uh, Dr. Girardi, who was the the head of the the Senate and in charge of all the food, and they came up with a sweeping set of policy changes that have been implemented and extremely successful and a model for the rest of the world. The problem is in this country we we are lacking the political will to protect our children. And then in Chile, what they did was they eliminated any advertising to children any junk food or processed food between six in the morning and uh, 10 at night. They eliminated all the cartoon characters. So no more Tony the Tiger, Toucan Sam on Fruit Loops, they're gone. Instead, they put on black octagon warnings if it has too much- Always food. after me, Lucky Charms. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So they put on warning labels on the front of packages. So instead of having a health claim, like, oh, this is good for you, it has extra fiber, but has you know five teaspoons of sugar that you have to read on the back label, they actually say, this is harmful. So warning labels, like a cigarette packet. They also eliminated any bad food in schools. They eliminated infant formula marketing, and they put an 18% soda tax in. But the, what was interesting was the change in the marketing had far more impact than the soda tax, even though it was an 18% soda tax. Uh, and in this country, the, the, the food industry is, is severely opposed to any restrictions on marketing. Uh, and there's something called the First Amendment, or freedom of speech, which I, I believe is important, obviously, but I don't think it, it, it means that we can't protect our children because they are weak and vulnerable and they are not, they are not able to protect themselves. And we need to be, as adults, uh, protecting them. And, and the, the malicious marketing of food to these kids is hooking them early and hooking them for life. And it's why we see now one in three kids born today will have diabetes in their lifetime, one in three. And you know, <clears throat> when we see the increasing incidence of things like diabetes and autism, uh, and certainly allergy, asthma, uh, ectopic, atopic disease, uh, you know, this is obviously not a genetic issue or the, that incidents would remain static. Suddenly the environment is changed. The biggest part, I think, uh, is food and the quality of the food. 
beyond the sugar and the highly refined nature of our food. So you also talk about <clears throat> so many of the chemicals that are found in our foods. And I want to talk about that. Have you, have you talked about that? I'm going to listen. Uh, but also uh, <laughs> how the FDA really isn't stepping up to protect us as we would think the FDA would do. I mean, I, I've learned everything I know from you, David. So you, I could interview you on this. <laughs> so you're right. Uh, the, the FDA is asleep at the wheel here uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, they allow so many ingredients in our food that are not allowed in most of the rest of the world. Like, for example, azodicarbonamide is a subway mat ingredient, yoga mat. Sorry, it's a yoga mat ingredient that's found in subway bread. And it was outed by Vani Hari, a friend of ours, uh, and they took it out. But in, in in uh, Singapore, if you're a food manufacturer and you use azodicarbonamide, which is a softener for bread in your products, you go to jail for 15 years and you get a $450,000 fine. Okay, that's the stuff we allow in our food here. BHT and other uh, butylated hydroxytoluene and chemicals and dyes and additives. Uh, we, we are not allowing uh, the science to dictate what is safe or not safe in this country, and we're allowing industry to dictate it, and that's really Gee, important. Who, uh, who knew? Yeah, who knew? And then, and then, of course, they allow antibiotics. Of the 37 million pounds of antibiotics uh, in our food supply, and in our supply, 30 million is used for animals for growth or disease prevention. Uh, and then, of course, they, they, the food labeling is so confusing. You know, on the food label, the ingredients are often so small you can't read them. They don't list the amount in percentage. So if the second ingredient is sugar, you don't know if it's 1% or 50% or 80%. Uh, and then they actually allow them to, for example, add multiple forms of sugar because in order, in order to uh, you know, put your ingredient on a label, the most abundant ingredient has to be listed first. But if you put in five forms of sugar or you divide it up between five different forms of sugar, even though sugar is the most abundant thing in the food, it doesn't have to say that. Right, so they have like four different kinds of sugar, uh, and they and they, and if you have a PhD, maybe you can understand the food nutrition facts label, but it should be clear: green, this is good for you; yellow, eat with caution; red, this is going to kill you. And everybody should just know what it is when they pick up a food, instead of being so confusing. So, in so many ways, the FDA is not protecting us. Uh, just as an aside, it, it's interesting that the same issues hold with respect to cosmetics uh, in, in the comparison oh, exactly. between what goes on in the United States. Uh, versus Europe. I mean, it's, you know, the things that people are putting on their skins uh, um, topically, which are absorbed, it's breathtaking. And again, we would think that the FDA would be there to protect us, but, um, you know, God so science would uh, be validated. Well, you so, people go to ewg.org, uh, which I'm on the board of the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, they can go to this uh, app they have called Skin Deep, and you put in your cosmetics or your shampoo or whatever you're using, your body care products, it'll tell you how toxic they are or if they're safe to use. So what's the effect then of this mass production of these uh, chemicals? What's the effect on the environment? Well, I mean, you know, the agricultural chemicals are the things that I, I worry so much about. And, and there's pesticides, there's herbicides, there's fertilizer. The most of Two of the most concerning are the, the um, fertilizer and, and the uh, glyphosate, which is the herbicide. Uh, the pesticides also, but here, here's the problem with fertilizer. One, it consumes 2% of the world's global energy supply to make fertilizer. We produce 400 billion pounds. It's one of the most energy intensive things we do. And when we produce it, we use fracking gas. So natural gas from fracking which produces about 40 to 50% more methane than conventional oil wells. And methane is a greenhouse gas that is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So you're, it's worse than cow burps and all that, if you're worried about that, if you're fertilizing your, your soybeans for your Impossible Burger or your, or you don't fertilize those because they have nitrogen, but or you fertilize your corn for your corn uh, uh, junk food, you're actually actually contributing to climate change. Then you put it on the soil, it turns into nitrous oxide, which is 300 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And then it kills the soil life, the microbiology of the soil, which is like your microbiome. So our microbiome and the soil microbiome are very interrelated. And when you kill a soil microbiome, the plants can't get the nutrients, it becomes dirt, 
and it, it actually uh, isn't able to be used to grow food very well anymore. And then it runs off into the rivers, lakes, and streams and pollutes the rivers and causes these algal blooms because the fertilizer is agnostic. It'll fertilize algae or it'll fertilize corn. And then that kills off all the oxygen, sucks out all the oxygen from the waterways, which then kills in the Gulf of Mexico alone, 212,000 metric tons of fish every year. And there are 400 dead zones around the world like this that feed half a billion people and are the size of Europe. So we really have a, a global problem just on that one problem. And then you've got the herbicides. So 70% of the agricultural chemicals used is glyphosate or Roundup. There's been over 3 billion pounds used just in America uh, since it was introduced in the 70s. And it's an herbicide. It's, a, it's a, basically a weed killer. But it's used on everything. It's on 70 different crops, even things that aren't GMO crops like wheat because it desiccates the wheat at harvest, makes it easier to get the kernels out. And it's in all our wheat products. I mean, there's more, there's more glyphosate in your Cheerios than there is vitamin D or B12, which they add to the Cheerios. <laughs> uh, so we have all these, and, and, the, and the problem with glyphosate is it's so damaging to the microbiome of the soil, and it's so damaging to your microbiome, which you write so much about, David, and glyphosate is one of the most noxious things. In, in one Impossible Burger, which is a GMO soy burger, there's 110 times as much glyphosate as is required to kill uh, off your microbiome. <laughs> so I- Yeah, I and I, I, for our viewers, I would uh, go back to the interview I did with Dr. S uh, Stephanie Seneff, a uh, lot of information there. You know, the, the original patent for glyphosate from Monsanto was for its use as an antibiotic. So, you know, the fact that it is so disruptive towards our microbiome and people are getting things like cancer, uh, et cetera, uh, is is certainly not surprising, yeah. you know, and it yeah. it takes me back to uh, to the immune system and where we are today, as you and I are having this virtual conversation, um, and that is, you know, we would say that the best defense is a good offense in terms of coronavirus. Well, we don't have anything offensive. We don't have any weapons to combat coronavirus as yet. There's some things that are, people are discussing and things in the pipeline. But the best thing we can do is shore up our defenses, i.e. our immune system. So mm. for people whose immune systems are uh, compromised uh, by virtue of the foods that they have been eating, what would your suggestions be right now from a food perspective uh, to change things and help to uh, reinvigorate and uh, maybe even rejuvenate immune function? Absolutely. I was pulling up this article. I just I printed out today, which I spilled some coffee on. <laughs> and it's called Diet and Immune Function. And I think, uh, you know, there's so much literature about the role of this. So we do, we do talk a lot about the bad foods, the ultra-processed foods, but we don't talk enough about the protective foods, the foods that actually protect us against disease. Uh, it's not just bad food and then food. It's bad food and protective foods. Uh, and there are so many protective foods out there. Uh, and I think, you know, for the first, the first, the first simplest thing to do in this time for people who are listening is don't succumb to the idea that this is a time to stay home and in, eat comfort foods and eat junk food and eat packaged food. This is a time you're at home. You can cook, you can make real food, you can nourish yourselves and your families, and you can learn skills that are going to carry you forward to a very healthy future. So that's really important. And use really ingredients. And I, you know, I went shopping recently. At, um, I, my ex-wife is, is not uh, doing very well. So I, I brought her $500 worth of food from Walmart, which is just all whole food. It was even organic stuff in there. And there was no processed food and there was enough food for months of, of, for her to eat. So I think, I think the idea that, that it has to be expensive or difficult isn't true. So you want to eat uh, really nutrient dense food because the nutrients like zinc and vitamin A and vitamin D and omega-3 fats uh, and vitamin C, these come from uh, really nutrient dense foods, whether it's omega-3 containing fish or whether it's uh, you know mushrooms that have vitamin D or whether uh, which also have basically protective things for your immune system, or whether it's the phytochemicals that are antioxidants, that are anti-inflammatory, things like turmeric, rosemary, ginger, garlic. These are really great foods to include onions with quercetin. Uh, these are really known to help benefit and boost the immune system. Also, making sure you take care of your gut, uh, which you get, again, David, you've talked so much about, but fermented foods and prebiotic foods and 
probiotic foods. These are really important for us to be eating now because our gut microbiome is critical for regulating our immune system. So it's really the same old advice we've been given forever, which is eat a nutrient-dense diet, eat a plant-rich diet, eat good quality protein, eat lots of omega-3 fats, eat lots of spices, eat lots of colors, get rid of the starch and sugar. I mean, it's, it's just the same advice because it works for everything. And it might, you know, David, you, you gave a lecture many years ago and, and I'm like, you're like, there isn't a diet that's going to cure heart disease, but give you cancer. And another diet that's going to give you cancer, but it's going to cure dementia. Or a diet that's going to cure dementia, but it's going to give you diabetes. It's like, there is a way of eating that's going to help all these things. And I think it was one of the most uh, insightful things I ever heard you say. And I think it's really true. And it's the same thing for your immune system. Well, you know, uh, as far as your book goes, Food Fix, I, you have a copy. <laughs> so do I. Uh, I'd like that our uh, viewers would read this, but with through the lens of their current situation. Yes. Uh, and then we, you know, later on when everything is resolving, then we can start to think about, uh, you know, what are the other implications of our whole food system? Uh, what, is, what are the flaws in SNAP and in food sn uh, stamps, et cetera? All of these things we talked about, advertising to children. Yes. We talked about that uh, in terms of their online experiences. But I think right now, in terms of the relationship between chronic degenerative disease, underlying yeah. disease, and bad outcome from coronavirus, I think if people were reading your book with that in mind, it's a home run for them. Because Absolutely. as you mentioned, you know, this is how the we're rejuvenating. The book, is called, the book isn't called Food Apocalypse. It's called Food Fix, right? So right. it's really about the solutions in there, of what to eat and how we need to change our policies. And and I'm working on that in Washington with a whole campaign team. And, and we're really, how do we, how do we help people through this coronavirus epidemic understand that chronic disease is such a threat, that it is something we need to deal with and that we can do it together? Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, irra irrationality, impulsivity, fear, uh, mm -hmm. on the part of people's behavior right now. And interestingly, you call attention in your book to that the relationship between the foods people are generally eating uh, and uh, these issues. Uh, where do we go with that? Well, yeah, of course, you know, uh, the brain and the body are connected. And as you've taught me, David, there's, you're not a brain and a body, there's just one system. And, and we know that the food that we're eating is having incredibly harmful effects on mood, depression, anxiety, violence, divisive behavior, conflict, suicide, homicide, and we're like, how does food connect to all that, right? But turns out the data is there. If you look, for example, at prisoners in prison who have committed violent crime and who are continuing to commit violent crime in prison, if you swap out bad food for a healthy diet, violent crime goes down by 56%. And if you add a multivitamin, because they're all nutritionally deficient, it goes down by uh, another uh, up to 80%. Uh, in kids and uh, juvenile delinquents, 3,000 kids studied, they did the same kind of study where they gave them healthy food. They found dramatic reductions in the use of restraints, like 75%, 100% reductions in suicide. A hundred, I mean, suicide is a third leading cause of death in this population. And yet, you know, we were able to dramatically reduce it just giving them healthy food. Sugar and starch increase cortisol, adrenaline, the stress hormones. So if you're e e feeling stressed, the worst thing you can do is eat more foods that produce a stress response in your body, uh, in addition to suppressing your immune system. So it's really uh, incredible when you look at the data on this, uh, when you see kids uh, and, and, their, and their behavior and their ADD and their um, uh, uh, um, oppositional behavior, it's just so obvious when you start to change diets how much of an impact that has. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned a moment ago that uh, you know people are are holed up in their in their homes and reaching for comfort foods because they, for whatever reason, they think they need comfort. But this is when you need to think about your diet perhaps more than ever because uh, now you're being challenged, and this is when you need your best defense. That's right. Yeah, the best offense is a good defense, exactly. And I think you know people don't understand that that you can dramatically reduce your risk of getting sick dramatically reduce your risk of having bad outcomes by taking care of your body and making it as resilient as possible. So food is medicine is number one, two, and three. And then there's exercise is medicine, sleep is medicine, stress reduction is medicine. So meditation, I've been meditating every day, doing yoga. Uh, you know, I just, you know, there's all kinds of online courses. I'm seeing all my yoga classes I used to go to are now offering online classes. 
my wife just is working out with her trainer doing a virtual training session. So there's, there's a lot of ways to actually help people through this, uh, through home care and self care, but you've got to make sure you're eating well, sleeping, exercising, dealing with, uh, you know, calming down. Don't be on a, uh, we'll call it doom surfing, you know, which is doom <laughs> surfing, you know, where you're constantly like glued to the news and listening to all the terrible stuff. Give yourself an hour a day, get caught up on what's happening and, you know, go about your life and, and start to use this time as a spiritual practice, as a journey of self-care. Because, I mean, think about it. There's nobody going to McDonald's right now. America's health is going to improve, right? I mean, I mean, less people are eating, buying all the junk food, but all the crap people go out and eat all the time. People have to cook and eat at home now, which is a whole new thing for people. 50% of meals are eaten out of the home. And now everybody's eating at home. Right. So it's actually maybe there's a silver lining here of teaching people that, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can feel better. Yes, I can actually uh, take care of me and my family in a way that it is actually easier than I thought by cooking and eating real food. We had a, a, a repairman in, in our home uh, several months ago, and there is a section of the town I live in Naples that's uh, very highfalutin. And he said that he, he has been to many of the houses there and the kitchens have never been used. Yeah, yeah, uh, and you know, they're they're the appliances have never even been been used. It's it's, it's pretty right. breathtaking. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me close with uh, asking you this question: are, are you taking any nutritional supplements right now? I am. Well, maybe you could share with us what you normally take and what changes you've made uh, lately uh, in an attempt to uh, confront the situation that we're in. Well, normal, normally, I do take a range of things. Uh, I've had a number of chronic illnesses myself. I've had mold toxicity, mercury poisoning. I've had all sorts of gut issues. Uh, and I'm really healthy not going right now because uh, I know what to do. Uh, but but I do take uh, multivitamin, fish oil, vitamin D. I take um, some mitochondrial support. I take NAD. Uh, I take CoQ10, lipoic acid. Uh, and then, and then I take some other stuff. I take turmeric as an anti-inflammatory for cumin, uh, really important uh, uh, anti-inflammatory. I also take probiotics. I do a gut shake every day, which is prebiotic, probiotics, polyphenols, cranberry, pomegranate, acacia fiber that uh, I learned about from you, David. And uh, you know, I just put it all in a little shake and drink it up, keep my gut healthy. Uh, and uh, and I think you know there are other things that are immune tonics you can take, for example. A zinc, as well as things like quercetin and uh, some of these Chinese mushroom extracts. There's controversy about that, but I th think they're still okay. So I think there's a lot of potential for uh, getting getting a good nutritional uh, support for you. You don't have to go crazy. You don't take everything. There's a lot of people pushing all kinds of stuff. That's I think for sure. There's a lot of just sensible stuff out there that we can do. Uh, you know, it's funny. At the end of the day, uh, though, we uh, our paths are somewhat uh, divergent. Uh, I'm probably doing just about, you know, about 80 to 90% of what you just mentioned. Yeah, well, uh, you know, we attended, uh, you and I both attended an, an interesting lecture by our colleague, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Bland, uh, a couple months back in, uh, in New York. And he was talking about senolytics and the, the notion of natural products that can help, uh, help our bodies rid themselves of senescent or dysfunctional immune regulator, immune cells. And one of the ones that, that's really gotten a lot of interesting press lately is one called Fisetin, F-I-S-E-T-I-N, made from strawberries. So I've added that to my regimen because I think right now it'd be good to uh, kind of get rid of the, you know, the dead wood and, and then repopulate with some healthy uh, immune cells until we hear about another product that may be coming in the future, we don't know. The other thing that I think uh, is really uh, intriguing is the idea of fasting uh, in terms of amping up immune function, certainly not recommending that for everybody, but it's certainly worth exploring. But uh, it sounds like you're taking all the good stuff. Try My it. friend, I, I, I wish you well. Let's talk offline as well. You know that I love you and respect you. And uh, I appreciate our time together. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me on your show. And uh, everybody listening, stay safe, stay well, take care of yourselves. This is not a time to indulge in bad habits, but to find new ones and cook because that is going to save your life <laughs> yeah. all right we'll talk soon all right bye-bye well that was a great interview uh mark's doing all the things i i i really respect him as many of you know for many many years we've worked together and uh we will see it through uh we'll see it through this as well and 
Again, what is his message? His message is that, is that food is our most powerful ally here in terms of our defense, in terms of uh, bolstering our immune system, which we so desperately need right now. So again, the great book, you probably have time to read now. Uh, it is Food Fix. Let's see if you can see that. And uh, by Dr. Mark Hyman, uh, terrific guy. So thank you for joining me. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, and I'll be back soon. See you then.